Steven told you, my name is Matea. And you can recognize me by my hair. It was a bad hair day, hair day for this picture. Sorry about that. Uh, I work as a business analyst in Inc. ICT, or product owner, as you wish. Uh, so, as all business analysts, I have a terrible time. I have a of asking a lot of questions. So, I'm going to do that right now. So, tell me, how many of you do some sort of agile in your companies? Hands up. Yeah, okay, some sort, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I recently t uh, heard a story about, I think it was Mike Cohn. Uh, he was in a conference with 400 people, something like change, and he said, uh, in this room of four, 400 people, there are probably 400 ways of uh, different agile uh, methods. And they were like, yay! And he was like, no, that's a terrible idea. I don't think that it is. We'll talk about that later. Okay, uh, another question. How many of you have worked on a project with a fixed budget, fixed scope? Yeah, okay, great. Last question, for now. Uh, it's not, are you hungry? I know that you are. Uh, have you ever been on a rafting trip? Yeah? Ooh, cool. Okay. Then. So that's what we're going to do in the next five or so minutes. Jump into a raft together and see what rapids we have uh, in a fixed, fixed project. Uh, okay, so if you think about it, uh, a whitewater raft is sort of a good analogy for, for software projects. Why? You have uh, clients and you have a uh, development team. They are all in the same boat, uh, whether they like it or not. And maybe you can see the product owner as the skipper of this, uh, of this boat. So he's trying to uh, safely uh, get all, all everyone in this raft uh, safely downstream. Uh, not only alive maybe, but maybe to give them also some sort of a sense of a content because nobody wants to go home from a rafting trip feeling, uh, feeling miserable, right? Uh, you can also, um, if you take uh, the uh, point of view of a project manager, he can also be, let's say, a skipper of a raft, but his boat is much crowder and has much bigger rapids downstream, so I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, this presentation will uh, talk from, uh, from a business analyst point of view. Okay, so fixed scope projects. Uh, you are all probably familiar with the uh, iron triangle and all that stuff. So just a quick recap. We have a bunch of constraints there, budget, time, scope and quality in the middle, right? So mostly what that means is that you have a client that says I have a 100,000 euros and I want this, this and this to be delivered by October 23rd, 2019, right? Okay, and so most of the time, so always there, there is a budget. No, no client has uh, an unlimited amount of money, right? Unless you're <coughs> Jeff Bezos or something like that. Uh, you usually don't have clients that will tell you, okay, you just go do your work and finish whenever, right? You always have some deadline. Uh, and no client will tell you that it's acceptable to have bugs in, in the product that you deliver. Right? So quality is usually non-negotiable. What you are left to deal with is the scope. Uh, which is kind of like fixed in these, uh, these projects, but we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. Okay, um, so there are a lot of problems with these kinds of contracts and projects, and uh, they can all be summed up in one word. They are okay. <laughs> they are really inconsistent with the real world. They are like totally away from reality, because why? In each software project or project in general, no matter how great team you have, how great a client you have, how big of a budget you have, there are always some complexities that will just keep you away from the planned uh, deadline. You will always have some unexpected uh, turns. So the real question is, why do we still do this? So why not just convince all clients to go time and material, to do full agile or whatever? Maybe there are some cases where you cannot do this. For example, the public sector or similar, similar clients. Why? Because they usually have some constraints, either political or financial, because the way they finance their projects is determined by, I don't know, EU funding, some national project funding, or uh, they just have to have, I don't know, follow the public <coughs> procurement method. And this usually means that uh, they put a, a list of requirements that this product should have, and then you bid for it, and then you win this tender, and, and you sign a contract and it is fixed. It's fixed deadlines, fixed cost, or a fixed, uh, a fixed budget for you, and, and that's what it is. You cannot avoid it. Okay, so this ends up and us up with a battle. Okay, so in the r red corner, you have the Agile man. 
So it's the cool, young, uh, flexible or whatever. That's the methodology to go, right? And in the blue corner, you have the old-fashioned, uh, bureaucratic, dictatorial waterfall. Uh, and that's usually, yeah, like the loser. Uh, but I think the problem is, and uh, there are some PMI experts who would also agree, uh, that the problem is that usually uh, agile is compared to bad waterfall. Uh, so we believe, or in our projects, it, it uh, seemed like a good combination to take the best, best of both worlds, right? So we follow the Aristotle principle of golden mean. So take the best out of the waterfall, take something out of the agile, and try to go with that. Uh, okay, so let's see uh, how we did. Uh, let's talk about problems. So, <laughs> yeah, we don't want to end up like that. Although it can be fun. Uh, <laughs> uh, so let's see what kind of challenges uh, we encounter in, in fixed uh, budget projects. Problem number one. Okay, so uh, this, these are our clients, and this is the world that they live in. It's their own planet, they have their rules, their processes, and we usually have no idea or some sort of vague idea of what, they, what, what it is that they do. Uh, and that's okay. Uh, we live in a different planet, that's the software development one. And the usual way to go is what the business analyst or the product owner, if it's on this side, is uh, we try to get information from, from this world, right? Okay, but what we tend to forget is that we have to do, do it otherwise. So if we ask from them, tell us what you do, how it is, uh, what you want to do, how, how, how do you want to improve, we have to also uh, make them understand our rules, our processes, our ways. Because it, 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 this is also a strange, different, strange planet from them. And we usually forget that. We just assume that they know everything about software development processes. And then we are really surprised when, when they don't and when, when they get angry because we are mentioning change requests or whatever. Okay, um, so what's the solution here for this problem? It's to tell them about it, yeah? to get them understand what it is that we do. Um, my first project, uh, we, we totally forgot about this. That, that was my first experience in software development. We just jumped right into workshops, uh, right into analyzing requirements, writing the specification, forcing them to read it, to sign it, and then throwing a bunch of change requests at their face, and they were like angry, they were surprised. They didn't like the responsibility, the, the lower key users that they have to, I don't know, sign off at something, say that it's gonna cost more or less. It, it just wasn't familiar with them. We, ha we had to do this because we were on a tight deadline, and it was just a natural way for us to go. On a different project, the one I'm working on right now, we, we tried to pilot a different approach. So we actually, at the beginning of the project, we just assembled all of the key users on a one-hour workshop, and uh, we did a short uh, education for them. So we said, okay, here's a short analogy. We're gonna tell you what, who we are, what we do, and what we expect from you. Uh, what we did is compare it to uh, something that they all understand, which is uh, how to build a house, okay? So we just compared phases in our project development with phases in building building a house. And it was kind of like clear to them. So we have to have some foundation, we need to define what you really want because the tender documentation was vague. Uh, we need to write the detailed issue in order to know what to do, but we expect some changes, it's all natural, but we also need a way to deal with those changes. And we just thought that it would be a good idea, and it turned out it was, that they are really aware what the process will be, what's expected of them, what is, what, what they are going to get. Okay, so that helped us to really set their expectations. That uh, really is, kind of tends to be the, the biggest deal in the whole process because if their expectations go way through the roof or if they are in a totally different place than from what you're doing, then you're in a bigger trouble. Okay. Um, one of the other things that uh, we usually tend to forget is that uh, most of these users, that's extra job for them, uh, participating in a, pro in a project, right? Because they have their daily processes, and when you think about it, how many hours of their normal daily work is taken off their backs to, to help you get the software implemented? Probably zero, right? Okay. Problem number two. Uh, that's the, let's say, usual one. It's the same in Agile projects, it's the wants versus needs. Of course, you have clients who tell you this and this and this is what we need to uh, implement, but of course your job is to see if this is really what it is. Um, sometimes they, they tend to see 
us as your waiters. So you just, uh, they come into your shop and they tell you, okay, I want a double fried cheeseburger with a Coke and fries aside, and, uh, and that's it. Let me know when you're done. I want to pay for it 20 bucks or whatever. And that's how they see us. Uh, it might be true if you're taking off-the-shelf uh, software like Microsoft Word or whatever, but it's not true, especially for enterprise uh, custom development. And we don't want to be waiters, right? Does someone know what this is? First car, yeah, that's true. Okay. First car, uh, made by Henry Ford, Model A. Um, he was famous for his quote. Uh, so he said that if he had asked his customers what they want, what, what do you think they would have said? Faster horses. Faster horses, right. Why is that? Because it's not that they don't know what they want, that's true, but they don't know what they can get. That's also a good idea. Uh, so they, couldn't, they are not capable of imagining maybe cars, and that's your job, to imagine cars. Imagine what they, you can do for them, right? Okay. So in the context of our nicely fixed uh, budget slash waterfall approach, you have all these familiar phases from planning, analyzing, designing, developing, testing, and then deploying to production. Uh, what it is we do here to discover their needs? So we took, we cannot, uh, this, this was, let's say, originally planned. So we are stuck with fixed, uh, fixed deadlines uh, and fixed budget, okay? And then we focus on these two, these two phases, analysis and design. Okay, if we stretch them out a little bit, we applied uh, not really agile, but let's say iterative development here. So uh, basically what we did is in a series of uh, workshops, we, we tend to uh, plan the workshops okay, with our users, we analyze the stuff with them, then we go home, let's say, and design the solution, write a small part of the spec, uh, do some smaller prototype, mock-ups, and stuff like that. That's the development part, let's say. Then we go back to them, test it with them. So make them proofread it, uh, check the prototype, see, see if something is wrong with it. It sounds really obvious, but we, we usually tend to forget it. Or we do, this, we do this internally and then leave them with the, I don't know, 100 thousands of pages or whatever. They're not going to find uh, bugs in it or, or something is wrong. They don't even know how to read it. So that's the part where iteratively and make, them, uh, make it easier for them. And in the end, make it easier for yourselves. So as I said, mock-ups, wireframe, prototypes, anything visual, graphic can help you, really help you and help them. Also, it sounds obvious, but it's of, often neglected in uh, fixed, uh, fixed code projects. Uh, okay. This also gives you a chance to not only uh, you will elicit requirements and see what the real needs are, but uh, you also need to prioritize them or, or make them prioritize it. See what, what the most important ones are to which the least ones are. This is going to be really, really helpful once the project gets to the rapids, and it will. Uh, this really is a good negotiating point uh, for the PM or for, for the product owner to, to make them see what the, what maybe, which requirements maybe are not really necessary. Okay, so this part uh, of the project really helps you define the scope and you have to define it. You cannot go really agile here because then you will blow up your deadlines and blow up your budget. That's, that's the reality of these kinds of projects. Uh, and you have to document it somehow. Either it's uh, user stories, functional specifications, something, but you need to have some sort of a formal sign-off from them because otherwise, as I said, you, you are stuck with your constraints. Okay, problem. Three. Um, has anybody played Code Monkeys? No, no. Okay, uh, this is a common problem. Um, I don't know if you ever had these uh, fights in your daily scrums or whatever stand-ups. The, the, the unnecessary maybe uh, discussions between testers and analysts, and developers. It's just a waste of energy, right? Okay, so. Uh, what you want to do with your team is not just make them follow, uh, follow strict user stories that were there and just implement it and, and that's it. I don't care about the end product or don't even know what it is. Uh, there's a great blog that I, I really like to read. It's called Wait But Why? And there's a great article there. Uh, it's called uh, Your Life is a Picture But You Live in a Pixel. So uh, 
this is your life, okay? And th this is uh, how you like to envision it and you like to see what you, what you want to accomplish or whatever, but you are stuck here. You're, you live through Monday and Tuesday and, and your, let's say, <laughs> regular Wednesday is really nothing special. And then the article goes that you should, that approach makes you lose the, the importance of uh, every day, which again, they make up your life, right? Uh, if you take a look at the software development or the iterative process in Teams, uh, the, let's say the, the uh, typical developer, he's stuck in one day. He's focused on that, on his daily tasks, on his sprint, and that's it. What you need to do is help them, help the team see this, see the picture, see what they, they will and they have to accomplish with the whole product. How do you do it? How do you make them care? How do you make them see that this, what they are doing today, the unit test that they are writing, that it's really something important. I know it sounds really like a, some motivational speech or whatever, but, but it shouldn't be. You need to care about the product, right? You, you need to show it actively every day. Uh, and you need to involve them. How to do that? Uh, don't keep s secrets from them. So just uh, let them know. Let them know about the problems that you have. Let them know about the user desires, wants, needs. Let them... Uh, Help them envision what their products will do, right? Okay, if you... I showed you the picture and the animation of the uh, public sector guys, right? If they know that there is something that they are doing today, if they are writing a functionality which will help, I don't know, a nurse uh, tomorrow to better treat a patient, maybe this will help him or him or her to, to think more about this, this uh, stuff that he does and not just to make it as a task that he will cross off. Okay. Uh, also, a good thing to do is to, uh, uh, to, to to ask for advice. So, you, as a business analyst or a product owner, you, you don't know everything, right? You cannot know, and you're not the smartest guy in, in the room. So, uh, you should ask them questions, ask them to participate, uh, involve them in every possible way, and they will surprise you every time in a good way. Okay, let's talk about the third problem, or was it fourth? I, I just did that to, to see if you're awake. <laughs> okay. Uh, as the business analyst here, you always have like this, uh, let's say, it's, it's an internal battle between you don't want to be uh, allowing scope creep, scope creep, sorry, and uh, you don't want to, you don't want to breach your budget, you have to think about your company's interests, right? But on the other hand, you really, if you love your job, you, le you really want to build the right thing and you want to help them get whatever they want, what you think is useful or whatever, but, and then <laughs> you have to always make the trade-off between that. Um, what you can do here, and without hurting <laughs> uh, the company, is maybe introduce them with the, with the concept of change for free. It's also a famous uh, uh, concept done, done by uh, uh, some smart guys, you can find it online. Uh, basically what it says is that uh, if you do the whole uh, requirements discovery and introduce your customers to the uh, concept of backlog and, and the values of each, uh, each item, then when the change arrives, and it will, and you say, okay, this costs 15, what you can do is say, okay, we will do it for free. It will not affect your budget, not your schedule, but you have to get rid of something here from the stuff that we have to do. You choose, we don't care, as long as it's not something that we already started working on. Okay, and that usually let's say in the perfect world, they, they would say this, okay, lose these two and I, I want this, okay? If not, we can also have this, but you have to lose the constraints. So either we will go over budget or over time. Okay, um, another good trick here uh, is to, I hate diagrams, uh, because they, they usually, <laughs> they don't tell you anything, it's just a bunch of, and you're like, okay, nice, but how, how, do, how do I implement this? What's this in my life? But this one is really good. Um, basically, what it says is that uh, if you're if you're a customer who wants to buy a car, okay, um, what you have is is really a set of requirements for that car. Okay, these ones here are the ones that you don't even mention. I mean, do I have to say that I have to have uh, working brakes or a steering wheel? Okay, no, but I will be really pissed off if, if it's not there, right? Okay, uh, then there are your requirements. I want a car that has an AC or uh, I don't know some um, uh, parking helpers or whatever. And then there are ones that really delight you, that you didn't think of, okay? Like some sort of ultra-convenient cup holder or whatever. 
it's the same thing with your customers. If you find this, and especially if it doesn't cost that much, uh, you can really do some good trade-offs and some quick wins with them. So that, that's really, uh, and it's really something that you cannot, uh, you have to practice that and you have to uh, have some sort of a soft skills. It comes, I guess, with experience. So. Okay, problem number four, five. Uh, is estimation challenges, okay? So basically, you are stuck with something that, uh, so you have a contract signed. Somebody else did the, the estimation and said, okay, we, we can probably make the, the deadlines and it fits this cost and okay. And then this goes to the actual development team and you do your best to, to fit in, in uh, within those constraints. But uh, uh, usually when you uncover everything the scope of the work is, it usually grows. The, the, the original estimate, it's just, it goes through the roof, okay? And you cannot change <laughs> the, what is signed, okay? What you can do is, uh, so from these phases, you, you are now in the dev design, develop, and test phase internally. Uh, you can really, okay, then again apply agile principles, again sprints or whatever, and keep in mind or, or always uh, do the estimations, do the, the prioritization, do the replanning as you go. Why is that important? Uh, you need to be able to give okay the product owner, but also the PM, a, a way or a visible way of, of seeing when the stuff goes wrong, okay, as soon as possible, so that he or she knows okay this is time to, to do the rolling way planning to go and start negotiating with our customers or whatever. Okay, so so always replanning, replanning, replanning. If you're in trouble, it's better to know it uh, in advance and and have uh, some. Uh, some negotiating around with your customers, because um, I recently heard a good, uh, good, uh, good saying. It says that there are deadlines and there are promises, nothing in between. So the projects. I mean, when somebody says, "I need this by April 19, uh, 2019," what is that? I mean, why? Random date, probably. Sometimes it's not. If you are, I don't know. If, if it's something really, really fixed in time, okay. then it's a, it's a deadline. Everything else is a promise. So this is also a, a good breaking ground for, for, the, for the PM. Okay. The last problem, I promise, is the uh, responsibility part. So mostly when, when the things go wrong, I mean, when, when works get, uh, gets uh, prolonged, uh, there's usually the, the question of responsibility. It's not the blame, but it kind of can sound like that. So you have the team versus the individual blame. Usually Agile uh, kind of tends to see this as a whole, uh, the team. And when they're doing their estimates, they, of course, they're human. They will, they will make errors. They cannot predict future. But uh, Agile is also a good framework for, it's good for slackers uh, sometimes, it can be, because uh, what if you have uh, someone who will, who will constantly just hide behind bad, bad estimates <clears throat> and affect your team's productivity? Uh, sometimes the team is, is to be blamed, let's say, or is responsible as a whole, and that is fine. If they all forgot about something, okay, we will deal with that. But sometimes there is time to, to single out a person and say, okay, you are not doing stuff uh, as, we are, uh, as we all as a team want you to do. And, uh, this is, I would say, also a very, very difficult part, maybe the most difficult in these kinds of projects. And uh, we had examples with this, um, both ways we dealt with it. Uh, I think the, the, the good way is really to, to, not to, not to hide about it, just to single out this person, do a talk one-to-one, -one. it's usually the PM and the, in the, in the Scrum Master, See, make them see, give them, give him or her a feedback, and then see how it how it goes. Usually, the team will uh, will just single this person out by themselves. They, they can see that they all have extra work because of, of this person. Because in the end, they don't, they shouldn't have any impediments to to get to the the greater picture. Okay, and some final thoughts. Uh, so, if you're in this raft. The first thing you should know is you have to know your river. You have to try to predict what is downstream, whether it's uh, 12 feet tall uh, uh, rapids or it's just a, a, a small flow. You have to adapt your approach. So there is no perfect recipe. I know it's uh, <laughs> like I just, 
you have to pick your own uh, methods, whether it's uh, agile, what, what you're going to take from there, whether it's a uh, waterfall, which parts you are going to combine, you just have to adapt as you go. Uh, advice is to involve everyone, not just the customer. As I said, you have to educate them, keep them involved in the project, but also your team. They all have to feel uh, responsible for, for the project and the, in the final outcome. And in the end, you just have to enjoy the ride. Thank you.